he's all huffy and he's gonna is he gonna go I hope he goes in the hole because he's well no no he's I just introduced him in there and he's been real that? huffy today what is that it's a it's a bull snake a bull snake he looks like a diamond west well he's got blotches yeah you know, and, and that's this a, a cambridge that's a timber or cambridge rattler yeah that snake's older than you <laughs> <laughs> now that snake's about about 33 years old I just noticed the other bull in here. Or yeah, there's two in there. Okay. Yeah. And behind you here is another another two. And there was a little something going on there a little while ago. I don't know if they finished or not. But uh, they're mm -hmm. among the uh, among the biggest snakes in America. And they 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 live all through the Midwest. But they um, these are from a little isolated pocket of sand south of Chicago near the town of Kankakee. Kankakee, a train yep. pulls out of Kankakee. That's exactly right. And uh, Kankakee has sand prairies, which are residual sand from Lake Michigan, when Lake Michigan um, receded. And the bull snakes on the Kankakee sand prairie are isolated, and they're kind of their own bull snake, and they're, they're real pretty, and they get real big. This, this cage is six feet long, and, this, yeah. and the smaller snake stretches, but the big girl here, she's, she's probably getting close to seven. So the big one is the female. Happens to be. Normally that's not the case, but it just has to do with her age. She just has to be older. Okay. So. Do you have any uh, any other dangerous variety besides the cambridge? Well, yeah. Um, I just took a I just took a diamondback rattlesnake to um, to Texas to a new educational exhibit out there. But we have we have um, there's two copperheads, and there's a cottonmouth. That's an exceptionally dark. Delta, yeah. Delta cottonmouth. <laughs> so you call them a Delta cottonmouth? Well, are no, there... it's a cottonmouth, but I mean the ones in the Delta are particularly dark. So. And that's a really pretty copperhead. People say, "How can a copperhead be pretty?" Yeah. Look at the one on top. <laughs> yeah. That one's from from a little further down to the coast. Do you find that their colors vary with the location? A little bit, and they vary with individual to individual. This one I caught in 2004 as an adult, and so that's that's an old snake. Um, so, but you see, every, they 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 like their hide boxes. <laughs> okay. But snakes are secretive; they like to to hide. And uh, um, oh, for example, here. go if people if the general public has a favorite you know as far as the public goes it would be this one you know they they say well he's the good snake the speckle, you know, the speckle king snake he's the good snake well all snakes are good and they kind of raise their eyebrows when you say that but but uh, the only reason he's considered the good snake is because of their affinity for eating venomous snakes, you know. Yes. So, so, um, but the lots of snakes eat venomous snakes. Coach whips eat a lot of venomous snakes. Racers eat venomous snakes, and lots of snakes eat other snakes. Period. I mean, it's a perfect meal. It fits inside very nicely. Yeah. So, but but you know, more and more people are being removed from nature. Uh, they, you can tell that by looking at videos on on Facebook every day of people in Yellowstone National Park putting their babies on bears and walking up and trying to pet a bison. You know, they, they don't, their, their education is, is limited to sitting back in the recliner and watching Discovery Channel and Animal Planet. And they, they think you can do these things. And so um, it's... Um, it would behoove them to do a little more study before trying yeah, something Yeah, like and that. so you get people who pick up snakes who don't know how to pick them up and and they they get bit and so I don't know but that was my big that was my big thing over the years was was education you know making sure that people knew that you know these are all good things they're here for a purpose whatever your uh, religious views are you know um, religious scientific whatever you want snakes are here you know they're here and uh, so um, you're not going to get rid of them all and and if you did it would be an utter catastrophe. So, the people who understand the uh, the environment and the way things work understand snakes 
uh, control rodent populations, which sure. control other populations. Right. Snakes are both predator and prey. You know, and um, I have a I have a philosophy that if one of my yard king snakes that, that and we have a lot of king snakes right here on the property. If one of my yard king snakes is crossing the driveway out here, and a red tail hawk grabs him, I'm not going to intervene. I mean, he's. I love my king snakes. I love my snakes on my property, but but hawk has to eat too. Such is the way of nature. That's exactly right. And uh, and only once did uh, have we have we intervened, and that was with uh, a Louisiana pine snake, which was one of the rarest snakes, probably the rarest large snake in America, and highly endangered. And a, a hawk had him down, and he was. The hawk went hungry that day, <laughs> yeah. so. But uh, um, so mostly what I have are Mississippi snakes. You know, snakes that are. Yeah, that, I think maybe yeah. if people saw your presentation when they were in school or something, they kind of had an idea that, you know, at your house there is a black mamba or something. No, no. They, they, <laughs> well, they may have had that impression, but early on in my programs with Living Reptile Museum Productions, um, I would bring, you know, the required python. I would bring a python, and five or six kids at the end of, end of the program could come up and help hold the python at the end, you know, and they love that, and they remember it for sure. And I stopped doing that, and, and one of the reasons was that, first off, as soon as you took out the Burmese python, the question started up about the pythons in the Everglades, the pythons in Florida taking over, gonna, you know, and I, I got really tired of that. And the python didn't have any kind of um, message. There's no educational message. So Just I said, wow factor. Yeah, it was the wow factor. So I said, you know, we can do the same thing right over here. With an indigo snake, America's biggest snake, and uh, gentle, beautiful, endangered. They have a message, habitat, you know, endangered species, you know, all that kind of thing. And you can get five or six kids up here to help out with an indigo snake any day of the week. And these are average size adult indigo snakes. They get much bigger, much bigger than that. But it's a native species. And so I learned from years ago at the zoo that while we might have gaboon vipers and spitting cobras and rhinoceri and and chimps and exotic things. What people wanted to see when they came to the zoo, have you got a big old cotton mouth? Have you got, um, have you got white-tailed deer at the zoo? They wanted to see white-tailed, they wanted to see possums and raccoons. One of the most uh, uh, popular, pro popular um, exhibits at the zoo were the raccoons. And they had a little turning uh, water wheel that they'd get in and run like a hamster. And people love the raccoons above all else. And so later in my career, I stopped bringing exotic snakes and I started bringing Mississippi snakes. And that. Yeah, I just seem to recall at one point, uh, did, did you, maybe it wasn't you, but I think it was you. Did you bring a cobra? No. No. I've, I've had cobras. I've worked You've with cobras, cobras over many years. But there's a. He's getting upset over there. He's huffing and puffing. I'm going to put him, we're going to be in here for a bit, so I'm going to put him in another container. They're just, they're big blowers, but, but and they don't generally bite. They just make a lot of noise. Boy, he and, sounds like a rattlesnake. Yep, yeah, and they get killed. They vibrate their tails, they blow. He's getting ready to shed his skin. See his eyes? And how milky looking he is underneath? This is a, a pre-shed cycle. That he's going through, and sometimes they can be a little nervous at that time. They don't see very well. They don't and like they, the camera. <laughs> yeah, and and I just introduced him in there. Well, it's a big old eye <laughs> looking at him, and so. Um, so I'm pissing him off. <laughs> well, he's he's frightened. He's frightened. So I'm going to put him in a container here while we're here. We've got plenty of other bull snakes to look at, and uh, and he'll just stay in there for a while. So. That, he won't be so annoying, um, but uh, um, like I say, lots of different different things in here. But not nearly. You're seeing all these empty cages. Not nearly what I used to have. And part of that is, you know, like I said before, when you start to get a little older, 
what's your wife gonna do with all the snakes? You know, if, if something happens to you. She's gotta so, get another herpetologist to come in here and dole them out. Yep. Here's a, here's a favorite by a lot of people. There we go. Corn snakes. And corn snakes are native to Mississippi. Cousin to the chicken snake? Yep, yep, same genus. Uh, as a matter of fact, those, those farmers and country folks who take the time to distinguish between the two will often call this a red chicken snake. You know, most people when they see it, they cut his head off because they think he's a copperhead. Yeah. And they have the idea that a, that a copperhead must have a copper colored head. Well, there you go. But as you saw earlier, copperheads don't have copper heads in Mississippi. So, so uh, yeah. it's sad, but the, it's yeah. a real yeah. super popular pet and common throughout the state uh, outside of the Delta. This seems so. rather tame. Oh yeah, they're, they're fine. And you know, um, I'm not- I've very excitable before. Yeah, you know, a lot of this stuff was born here. A lot of these guys were born here. There you go. And uh, let me see, this snake was born 2006. And he's, he's old. He, I used him in my programs for years. And he's old and see, he's getting kind of kind of rangy now. But he was used in my programs for forever. And now he's retired. He doesn't, he doesn't eat as well as he used to. And, you know, so it's a, uh, you know, he's not dying, but he's not as, he's not as, uh, you know, as, as young as he used to be. Yeah. And so, like I say, most of my snakes are, are native. And um, the, the, the few venomous ones I have are, most of them are pretty much native to the area. And I live in the county and I'm, I'm good, you know, I'm good legally and everything. So, uh, um, you know, but anyway, uh, we have a few baby snakes. Once I breed a few rare varieties of baby snakes and, and, uh, and actually this right here is interesting. These are close relatives of the bull snake. These are Louisiana pine snakes. Huge. And uh, they, they do get bigger, but those are about average. And my, my buddy and I, uh, my best friend, Bob Young, um, Dr. Robert Young, he, uh, we were talking one day and we said, when's the last time you saw a Louisiana pine snake? Well, they were discovered in 1920. And up until about 30 years ago, they were known from, uh, from what was it, something like, 26 known specimens in the world. Oh, really? Very, very rare. We managed to acquire 11 more, and we began to breed them, and um, we introduced them to the to the industry, you might say, to the uh, the hobbyist industry and such. But but um, now uh, they're being, you know, if when we have babies, we haven't had babies in a few years. But when we have babies, they go to the Memphis Zoo. They take him out. I'm just gonna move this around where we can see him. There he is. And he'll just, you can come right up, no problem. I'll, I'll just kind of bring him out to the front. Pretty little snakes, there we go. And uh, people have the impression that they have no rattles. They say pygmy rattlesnakes or ground rattlers as well as people call them. And they say they have no rattles. Well, they do have rattles. and. They just can't make very much noise. Uh, his rattles broke off. He had a string of them, but he broke off with the last shedding. And they are a pit viper. They're, a, you know, a, a seriously venomous snake, but they're not. Um, they're not. Uh, no one's ever died from the bite of one. They. What sort of toxin is it? It's, it's a basically hemotoxin, like sure, most, okay. like most pit vipers. But we, um, n no one venom is completely one or the other. They all have components of each. And uh, like uh, Eastern Diamondbacks that are found in South Mississippi often show neurotoxic qualities in their venom as well. So, so. But so hemotoxin meaning that it uh, destroys affects, flesh? Yeah, well it affects uh, red blood cells and the linings of, of, um, of tissues and such, you have linings of vessels and things like that. And the whole idea, and, and people say, well, Snakes are okay, but not venomous ones. Well, you know, it's, it, it's real important to understand that 
that they have venom not to bite you. They have venom to bite their prey. And the idea is to bite that prey and back off, just, just get away from it, and safely wait while that prey goes off and dies. So a rattlesnake does the same thing a deer hunter does. He goes out and he investigates an area. A deer hunter will look for tracks, he'll look for scrapes on trees, and he'll, he'll, he'll want to see what the activity of the deer in the area are. He'll go out and just watch and just see if he sees any, you know, before the season starts. A rattlesnake goes out, finds himself a place where he's smelling a rat, a cotton rat or something, and he'll do the same thing as the hunter. He'll, he'll, just, he'll just coil up and wait. And sooner or later, the deer comes by. Sooner or later, the rat comes by. The deer hunter shoots him and then waits. And the deer goes off and dies. The rattlesnake bites the rat and he waits. And the rat goes off and dies. A rat can be tough. <laughs> a rat's a tough critter. And they both wait. And then what do they do? They track it down after it's died. They track the deer down, they track the rat down. They track it down and eat it. So rattlesnake hunts just exactly like a deer hunter. And, and people say, well, I, I kill a snake because I, don't, I see him this time, but I might not see him the next time. Well, that's ridiculous. It's, it's utterly ridiculous. The, the thing is, you, on your property, it has been said that you only see 3% of the snakes on your property. You know, there's a lot of snakes on your property. You only see a few of them. And, but at the same time, the chances of seeing the same ones running into that rattlesnake again are very slight very slight. They're, they're hard to see. They don't, they don't expose themselves and they have territories where they move around and travel. So killing that one snake isn't going to help anything. An, another snake will simply move in and take over that niche. So um, you, you're not doing anything by killing one except putting yourself in danger. And with the exception of one uh, authority, all other authorities agree <laughs> that the greatest number of snake bites in America happen during a deliberate interaction with a venomous snake. In other words, trying to kill it, trying to pick it up, trying to do something to it or with it. And, um, you know, and in some cases we find that anywhere up to 50% or more of snake bites happen during the attempt to kill or handle a, ven a known venomous snake. What do the children in Mississippi know? 45 years, millions, you know, maybe a couple million school children in Mississippi hopefully have grown up to remember and teach their own children that you take two steps back and walk away. That's my mantra. I've repeated that over and over again thousands of times in my career. Take two steps back and walk away. Look how close I am to this snake. There's nothing he can do to me. I'm, I'm utterly out of range and I don't reach in with my hand. I use an instrument, you know, just like that. And he's making no effort to attack me or, or come after me. And granted, if I reached in with him, it would scare him and very likely bite me on the finger. But I, you know, I show respect to him, I get respect in return. And so, um, so, his tongue's sticking out there. He left his, left his tongue sticking out. What's he doing with his tongue? Well, he, he's, he's analyzing uh, chemically all around him. He's smelling all around him. So that tongue comes out, the prongs of the tongue out of the air and off the substrate pick up molecules, scent molecules, and he brings them back in and they are sent to a small organ in the roof of the mouth. They're deposited there and from there they're sent to the brain and analyzed. So the snake's entire existence is based on chemistry. Everything around him has a smell. And uh, so when he bites a mouse and it runs away, he tracks it down with his tongue. So they also, you have to look closely, but lower and in front of his eyes, you'll see a dark, a dark pit, a dark spot. That's why we call him pit vipers. He has one on each side. If you look at him straight on, they're, they're oriented just like torpedo tubes on a submarine. And I'm just gonna let the audience know, I'm not very close to the snake, I'm zooming in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're 24 inches away. So, and the snake is 12 inches. Yeah, he's not so, a very long one. But those, 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 let me see, get him to look directly at the camera. Just turn your head there, turn your head back. And looking straight on, they're like torpedo tubes. They are in front of and uh, slightly, well, they're between and slightly below the eye and the nostril. 
uh, in, in fact, in, in Latin America, they often call pit vipers cuatro narices, meaning four nostrils, because they see the pit as being another another nostril there. But they, uh, when, there. when he does this, when I do this, he, he saw with his eyes and he saw infrared. He, he got an infrared image right there. It's a good thing you're not a rat. Just like that. And, you know, I'm warm and pink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so uh, um, but he doesn't smell a rat right now, if, or a mouse or a lizard or something like that. So a pit viper can hunt after dark on a moonless night and never lay his eyes on his prey. You know, and that's been, that was done decades ago where they simply put tape on a rattlesnake's eyes. That's all, you know, and they found out it didn't bother him a bit. And so the, the nerves in the pit on their way to the brain intercept the optic nerve and they become the same. The two, the two nerves become the same and when they get to the brain, he's seeing me just like you're seeing me but they're also, you know, they're also seeing a thermal image of me overlaid, probably blue and red and, and orange colors. So uh, he's, he's getting what you might see in a, in a night vision scope or something like that. Highly sophisticated, very, very interesting animals, pit vipers. So uh, among my, my, well, rattlesnakes, I've, I've just always had a, an affinity for rattlesnakes. So, and, uh, and again, the copperheads, you can see the pits on them just as well. Many times people say, is he looking toward you? Uh, I can't tell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of times people say, well, in our society we tend to think this way. What good is that animal? What does that animal do for me? What, what, how does that animal benefit me? And it's me, me, me. And that's, it's a little arrogant, but that's how we think. How does that animal help me? Well, um, pygmy rattlesnakes, copperheads, all venomous snakes. Their venom is used in, in uh, pharmacology and in medicine. And uh, Lucian Bonaparte, who was Napoleon Bonaparte's little brother, was the first to discover that snake venoms were made up of proteins. and and enzymes and things and so all the way back to there and the venom that is used to kill a mouse is also used to treat breast cancer and hemophilia and and um, does it coagulate yeah yeah and you know, we can thin your blood <coughs> sorry we can thin your blood we can thicken your blood so it, so if you've got a bleeding problem we can stop it with snake venom or components medicine made from snake venom and um, my father-in-law, you know, passed away with Alzheimer's. And anybody that's had a friend or relative with Alzheimer's knows what a horrible thing that is. They're using the, one of the deadliest snake venoms in the world, the venom of the black mamba from, from East Africa, in research to treat Alzheimer's. And the southern copperhead, not a northern copperhead, not a, a, an Osage copperhead from Missouri, not a, 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 a Transpecos copperhead from West Texas, the southern copperhead, the only one, his venom is being used in, in breast cancer research. So, you know, it's, it's and plus, we make anti-venom. We make anti-venom in case you get bit by a snake. So um, every person, you know, every person in America has benefited from snake venom, either directly as in a medicine made from snake venom or from techniques that were developed during the study of snake venom. So if, if you want to um, take a drug for a headache, if you want to take a drug for high blood pressure, if you want to take a birth control pill so that you can be comfortable, if you want to take any of it, it all goes back to this. It all goes back to the studies on snake venom. So we need to appreciate that. And people say, yeah, but if it bites me, well, we have about 125 bites a year in Mississippi, no fatalities. We hear about them, we check on them. Many times there's a person who has died, but they didn't die of snake bite. And so we, going back like 75 years, we can't find a fatality for a snake bite in Mississippi. But don't think that it, it you know, snake bite isn't important. It, it doesn't figure significantly into the health scene. It's just, not, it's just a, 
it, it, it's just not important enough. But if you're bitten by a, by a snake while you're trying to kill it, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Antivenin is tens of thousands of dollars for one injection. Mm-hmm. And they give you 10, 20, 30 injections. Each of them are, you know, it, it's incredibly expensive. Going to the hospital, you're going to lose work. If you don't have insurance, it can ruin you. You, you can be bankrupted. You can lose your car. You can lose, lose your house. You can lose your marriage because of everything that happens because you went to whack a snake on the head. You know, when, when you were told in school, you're supposed to take two steps back and walk away. So, so, so uh, you know, it, it is an, snake bite is an important thing, but, but not so important in Mississippi that it's anything to worry about. There's many, many more things that, are going, that you're going to suffer from before you suffer from a snake bite. How do you identify a copperhead? You know, sure. what are copperheads all about? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, um, because they're one of the most, they the most common venomous snake in Mississippi, right? Yeah, in uh, away from aquatic environments. Okay. Because cottonmouths are, in, you know, in aquatic environments. So uh, mostly. So, but um, copperheads are the most common pit viper, most common venomous snake we have in Mississippi, away from aquatic environments where cottonmouths are, are more abundant. Cottonmouths still leave those environments, and they they go into the hills and woods. You can find a cottonmouth anywhere. But copperheads are found right here in the woods. They're all around us right now, and they're they're um, they're not endangered. They're they're quite abundant. Yeah. <laughs> but but how many do you see? You see them crossing roads. They're they're easy to see when they're crossing a road. But if we pick him up and take him over there and put him in dead oak leaves from last fall, he becomes invisible. You're not going to see and, him very well. And so is he going to bite you when you walk by? Not likely. Not likely because that would give him away. I mean he's he's perfectly camouflaged. He wants no trouble. We're big and scary. We're predators. And for him to lash out and bite us as we're passing, or even as we've already gone by, that's just not smart for him to do that. You know, it's gonna give himself away and he's gonna get killed. So so they wanna stay still and rely on their on their camouflage for them to blend in with nature. And the the best way, notice too, he doesn't have a copper head. And and the name copperhead came from New England, where the Pilgrims first saw copperheads, the northern copperheads, which do have distinctly rust red coppery heads set off from the rest of the body. Yes. But ours don't, and, and so don't rely on the color of the head. Don't rely on the shape of the head. The idea that venomous snakes have triangular heads uh, is, is really ill-founded. Many harmless snakes have triangular heads. Many venomous snakes don't have triangular heads. So shape of the head is not indicative as ve- to uh, venomous versus non-venomous, but he's easy to tell. He has hourglasses wide on the side. They cross over wide on the other side, an hourglass just like for telling time. And um, some people say they look like saddlebags crossing over. Kids say they look like dog biscuits. Yeah. You know, so, (laughs) and now with the advent of the internet and me being an old school herpetologist, it's a little annoying to me but it really works. Hershey's Kisses. <laughs> right? I love it. Hershey's, Hershey's kisses. kisses. Now, copperheads are not found on the Gulf Coast. People will argue those are fighting words. They are not found on the Gulf Coast. Sorry. What, what are people, they seeing when people They're seeing they see baby it? cotton mouths. Okay. Baby cotton mouths um, are brightly colored. They're not dark like, like adults. They have cross bands like, and, and they have copper colored heads. And people will fight you over this, that they've seen copperheads in the Gulf Coast. There are no copperheads in the Gulf Coast. Uh, what, what are some of the most common Mississippi snake myths? The most common one? Sure. The snake will chase you. <laughs> I've heard people say that. You know, People say that you get between a cottonmouth and the water, and a cottonmouth will chase you. Or... Well, uh, well in, in that situation, a cottonmouth's trying to get to the water to get away. All you have to do is step aside, and he'll go right on by. He's not chasing you. Um, you know, I was chased by a cottonmouth after church last Sunday with my two little granddaughters, and it chased us the length of a sandbar, and you weren't there. So when people tell me that, well, you, you can make, make a decision as to what they're saying. No, that <laughs> never happened. It never happened. Nobody has ever been chased. They have no legs. 
And it's, it's really comical to think about that, how cartoonish it is of a person running down the wood, right down the road with his hat flying off and he's pumping his arms and he's, and he's, he's pumping those legs and behind him is a snake. It's a snake, him. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that it, could maybe yeah. happen with a mamba. No, they don't no, live here. No, no, no snake Wouldn't chases humans. No, but all around the world, people will tell you about snakes that chase you, and they don't. It's just like people will tell you about snakes that milk cows. They don't. Now that's they a crazy. One. <laughs> they they don't milk cows. Um, you know. Um, what would they do with the milk? They, well, they supposedly they drink? drink it. They, yeah, well, that, okay. that's the, the idea is that they attach to an udder and suck milk, just like any other animal. And they don't. Well, I think so. one of the one of the things that people say a lot, and I've heard people, you know, after your presentation, say, and that's just not true. Uh, is that uh, we can't find any record of anybody dying right. from a snake bite right. in Mississippi. I'm sure you run into that a lot. Yeah, I, I run, you know. when you were doing the presentation. Yeah, well, I, well, I still do because I'm, uh, I'm still a herpetologist. I'm just not on stage. You know, I'm still working in herpetology every, every day, working on a book on snakes in Mississippi. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, what can you do when someone says, well, my uncle died last weekend from a snake bite when, it, when they didn't? The thing you know, about I mean, it is, people, you have to have quantifiable data if you wanted well, to go about proving that. Well, we, we, you know, we have we have data. We get newspaper clippings and such, you know, through a clipping service. And, and you know, Joe Smith got bit by a rattlesnake on Friday, services on Monday. But when Mississippi State Poison Control, or even myself, investigate this, and we, we contact the doctors and the EMTs and such. Well, you know, Joe, Joe died, but there was no evidence that the snake was involved. Yeah, there was and cottonmouths, you know, there hadn't been a cottonmouth bite, in a, a, a cottonmouth fatality in over 75 years in America, in America. And a few years ago, drunk teenagers, you know, on a sandbar, playing around, and one of them finds a the cottonmouth, and he's got it, and, and he's beer in one hand and snake in the other, and, you know, um, it, it's morbid, but it, it gives credence to that hold my beer, you know, thing. People doing stupid things. Yeah. We are often the architects of our own misfortune. We bring things on ourselves, and we don't like to admit it. But he was bitten repeatedly while playing with this thing and would not take medical attention, and he died. You know, a, a, and a teenager shouldn't die of a snake bite. You know, so that we're talking about a large envenomation. There. Well, several envenomations. You know, he's bitten several times, plus alcohol in his system, which never helps the snake bite. But that's one thing I wanted to ask you about: is the the cousin to the cobra. Mm -hmm. uh, coral snakes are in Mississippi. They are. We have coral snakes in Mississippi. They range through the longleaf pine belt from about about Hattiesburg to the coast, and they swing up a little bit up almost to Meridian. Very uncommon. In 45 years in Mississippi, 46 years in Mississippi, looking for them with all my might, I have found one. I've collected one, but I've had 10 or 15 brought to me, you know, okay. from Picayune and Hattiesburg and Wiggins and down in that region. And the coral snake is, is a, um, gosh, everything that we learned from outdoor magazines and things about coral snakes, you know, kind of guaranteed to get you dead. <laughs> you know, the, the coral snakes are not nearly as deadly as, as people have let on, and 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 um, the uh, and fatalities are incredibly rare. But they do, uh, they are related to cobras and crates and mambas and sea snakes and such. And they have um, uh, neurotoxic venom, which affects nerves and breathing and such. And in their prey, and in those cases where humans have died of coral snake bite. It's where their diaphragm becomes paralyzed and they can no longer breathe on their own. Well, we have endotracheal tubes now. We yeah, can put them on a ventilator. We can put them on a ventilator, and and so um, we we do have antivenin for coral snakes. Um, most hospitals within the range of a coral snake do do have antivenin, no problem. And um, some doctors refrain from even giving it. They just put the put the patient on a ventilator and let it run its course, you know, and it and they they get better. So, but the things that we were taught when we were younger, even in Boy Scouts, uh, coral snakes have no fangs. Yeah, they do. They, they got small they fangs. Got, they got two fangs right in front of the mouth. They're not the big, long, switch blade rotating fangs of a rattlesnake that fold back against the mouth and then rotate outwards. Um, they're short little fixed fangs, but they're, fangs. they're that's elapid fangs, and they're, they're larger than all the other teeth in his mouth, so they're, they're right there. He 
doesn't have to chew on you. In fact, they, they don't chew. I mean, I, in my career, I've even said coral snakes chew. They don't. They bite and they hold on. Like Maybe it looks to some people like they're chewing. Right. And they, and they say, well, I jerked him right off of there. Good thing I didn't let him chew. And then they get sick. You know, so all he has to do is open his mouth and close it and have a little piece of you in between. Mm -hmm.